want to do a quick poll. How many people are uh, f first years? How many people have no monkeys and trees and the Atlas of Economic Complexity? How many th people think that's the most ridiculous sounding thing you've heard in a long time? <laughs> no. Good. So, so I, uh, you know, most of this is kind of uh, more developed research that kind of assumes a, a certain uh, pre-knowledge of some of the work that we do here uh, within the Growth Lab. So I will kind of uh, try not to be too heavy on some of that uh, type of uh, pre-knowledge given, given the audience, but uh, we'll look forward to discussing what we found uh, in a country like Chiapas. A quick summary of a lot of our research would be that we have uh, major research sh showing that fundamentally how diversified and complex an economy is both describes their current income and predicts uh, their future income potential. So we have uh, growth projections and, and other work that we do with the Atlas of Economic Complexity that then once we analyze what know-how and what capabilities you currently have, we can predict what new industries uh, are likely to uh, come about in that specific location. So we've done, you know, Professor Hausman has done that for the better part of a decade, kind of proving this model globally. And so we can begin to say countries like Mexico should really be getting into, uh, you know, uh, highly complex aviation industries, right? And when we start making recommendations uh, like that for Mexico, we're never making recommendations like that for some of the poorest states in Mexico. We're always making recommendations like that for the most complex regions uh, in Mexico, like Nuevo León in the north, uh, that provides most of the TVs, probably the TV that was uh, built and put in here. So we have very little to say about what should be done in some of the poorest uh, locations within Mexico. Uh, there's a important uh, McKinsey report that says uh, the two Mexicos, but uh, what we have actually found out is that there's not two Mexicos, there's actually uh, you know, thousands of Mexicos, that the income differential within the country is higher than the income differential between Mexico and the U.S. and other advanced <laughs> economies. So, so, not think, so this kind of fractal inequality that exists not just across countries but within countries has forced us to kind of rethink some of the major economic thinking. So, uh, you know, you'll see uh, Asimoglu and Robinson argue that institutions is the name of the game, that it, different countries' institutions describe their income development. And we have a fundamental challenge to that to say why then within one country with the same institutions, the same financial structure, the same religious affiliation, the same legal code, legal framework, same general interest rates, why do we see such inequality within countries? So we're trying to examine that through, through the case of Chiapas, Mexico, today. Uh, so when most people think of Chiapas, uh, the little that most people know, first of all, anybody been to Chiapas before? Very good. Uh, uh, so when most people think of Chiapas, they think of the Zapatista Revolution in uh, 1994, which you know, we saw uh, elements of during our travels there. Uh, you know, back then it looked a little bit different, but fundamentally afterwards, after that revolution uh, that correlated with the beginning of NAFTA, uh, the government took action, right? So the government spent considerable amounts uh, of resources in national and rural infrastructure as well as social transfers, right? And so the question became what happened to Chiapas after this focus and attention given to uh, the area, right? So thanks to that massive spending, we now can say that Chiapas has gone from the poorest state in Mexico to now being the poorest state in Mexico. Right? And so we're worried about this not because of, you know, so this massive income differential across states in Mexico uh, is worrisome not just because Chiapas is the poorest state uh, and that this income differential is six to one, but fundamentally Chiapas is also the slowest growing state uh, over the past decade. So not only is it the poorest growing state, it's the slowest growing state uh, in the country. Right? So we, we keep finding that the income differential between Chiapas and the average in Mexico continues to fall over time while other poor southern states in Mexico uh, have actually kind of uh, stabilized even, even though it's still worrisome that someone's income is half of the national average in Chiapas. Obviously we've now fall, the citizens there have fallen to only 40% of the average income of Mexico. Right, and so, so we see this even within Chiapas, right? So you have the capital city, Tuxla Gutierrez, actually has an average income that's higher than the Mexican average. And then we have the majority of municipalities uh, 
uh, that actually are amongst the poorest uh, in Mexico uh, overall. So, so what explains why some parts of Chiapas can actually be richer than the average of Mexico while we still have the majority of municipalities uh, with some of the poorest income levels uh, in the country, right? So we now see that what was six to one uh, across states in Mexico is actually 8.5 to one income differential between some of the poorest municipalities uh, and the richest, right? So we come to this question, why is Chiapas poor, right? Is it Chiapas or is it the Chiapanecos? The Chiapanecos are the uh, people from Chiapas. Uh, so we, we tackle this through uh, growth diagnostics, another methodology that we have at CID. Uh, it really tries to take a true signal rather than kind of simple correlations of saying education is low, therefore it must be education. We try to get real price signals. In economics, you can either focus on quantity or prices, and a lot of uh, simple correlations look at the easy to measure quantities. And growth diagnostics tries to really rethink and really refocus into a true signal that something is a constraint rather than a, a simple correlation of, of quantitative variables. So we're trying to get to the real price signals of saying this effect is low and therefore this must be the constraint, right? So when we study this, you know, one of the common arguments is it has to be education, right? Chiapas has the, the lowest education rate uh, in Mexico. But one of the fundamental questions we have is that what used to be three years of difference between Mexico and Chiapas now has fallen to, to two years, right? So Chiapas still has two years less education than Mexico, but that income gap has been steadily improving, that Chiapas is catching up. But again, Chiapas's income is not catching up. So what can explain this difference between what is catching up on some of the social indicators and not catching up uh, in education, right? So s some of the work and the difference between the rest of Mexico is the green line in Chiapas. Uh, what, we finally, what we fundamentally see is that to earn the same uh, as a Mexican worker with six years of schooling, you would have to have an average of 10 years of schooling uh, in Chiapas. So there is a major uh, educational gap. And then some people would say, well, maybe it's not just education, maybe it's also the quality of schooling. So thankfully we were able to control and incorporate the quality of schooling into this work, and we can say that the, the gap is still fundamentally the same uh, gap even when we can control for the quality uh, of schooling. So, so surely the low rates of education are a worrisome factor within Chiapas, but are they the, the determining factor, right? So then one, another way to measure that would be to say, well, what happens when a Chiap Chiapaneco leaves Chiapas, right? So, so we, what we were able to do then is to take the monthly income of the average income of Mexico. If somebody says, well, but that migrant is self-selected and primed to go abroad because they might be self-selected to be the best. So then we uh, also take it for the rest of Mexico. So what is the average immigrant or some average internal migrant make in the rest of Mexico when they move to a new state in Mexico? So we start with Chiapas having a lower income than average on Mexico. And then we say, what is the migrant premium when a migrant moves to a new state? What we find is that the migrant in the rest of Mexico earns on average 15.1% more, but in Chiapas they earn 51.6% more, such that the average migrant in the rest of Mexico earns the same as someone from Chiapas. So fundamentally leaving Chiapas, somehow these migrants are able to unlock a much higher income actually a higher income than the average Mexican and uh, an average income that compares equally to other migrants uh, in the rest of Mexico. So there has to be something then that tells us that why is it that a Chiapaneco with its low level of uh, schooling, with its you know, poor quality of schooling is able to leave and still have high returns like the rest of Mexico. So we look at the usual sus suspects, right? One could argue it's, it's that Chiapas is poor because it's less educated, as we saw, that the education is of lower quality, that it is more rural, it has a higher concentration of an indigenous population, uh, or also there are significant gender differences uh, in the workforce in Chiapas. Right? And so what, what we would uh, basically argue, and I can tell that the gra next graph is going to be uh, poorly shown, uh, is that uh, we can run a mensa regression uh, with a Oaxaca blinder decomposition and analyze, oh, looks like it showed up all right. 
uh, and analyze these differences. Right? And so what we basically find is that controlling for everything that you can include about the individual characteristics of a Chiapaneco and also some uh, place specific characteristics like the higher concentration of the rural population, this is only able to explain one third, the explained variation is only able to uh, explain one third of the income differences between Chiapas and the rest of Mexico. So all, even controlling for the worst education, uh, the lower education system in Chiapas, very little difference in average years of, of schooling, the uh, lower rate of female workers in Chiapas actually would th therefore uh, contribute in the opposite direction, but the higher indigenous population, there's still a large missing explanatory role that's happening once you control for everything that you can identify uh, and observe, right? So, so what is explaining that difference we still need to look at. Another uh, important kind of characteristic, well you might say, oh, the, but the financing terms and access to finance is a big constraint uh, in Chiapas. What we have seen is that the, you know, we would often look internationally at whether there's a high interest rate. And then what does that mean subnationally when the interest rate between the national level and the local available interest rates are very small in that gap. And then we've also seen that that gap has actually declined in Mexico overall and in Chiapas uh, over the past five years. So under improving lower interest rate, which is actually at a, a quite low rate uh, globally, we still see that Chiapas is falling behind. Right, so what explains why Chiapas continues to fall behind, why Chiapas has such a much lower income level uh, still needs to be uh, explained. We actually partnered with uh, a very interesting uh, Argentine anthropological group that did some really interesting studies in some of the rural communities uh, in Chiapas that fundamentally asked, you know, what three people in your community uh, do, you, do you most trust? Right? So when they did a similar study uh, in Argentina, in Tucumán, Argentina, they found that there were you know, specific individuals that were commonly cited by everyone as being kind of the village leader or the person that everybody trusts. And then they did the same study for Chiapas and found that there is a very low level of social trust that, that no kind of one village leader was identified uh, by more than three people in the entire uh, community. So th this is a kind of very interesting social dimension that we will uh, match to some of the uh, findings, right? So is it infrastructure? Uh, you know, so Santiago Levy and friends wrote a very interesting report saying it is about the radiality of Mexico in which all of the highway systems function through uh, Distrito Federal or the capital city in Mexico such that if you're trying to export to the US, everything has a bottleneck to get through the capital city. And so what needs to be done is we need to fill out all of the uh, expensive highway systems through the rest of the country. We need to fill in these black uh, zones such that the export to the US can be done on a much faster basis, right? So 14 years have passed. Uh, we now see that all of these highway structures have now been uh, completed. We actually see that the times saved in getting from parts of Chiapas to uh, the US uh, or other key parts of Mexico have shortened by six hours, by 12 hours, and still Chiapas is falling behind, right? So this massive spending on infrastructure as if infrastructure was the binding constraint and the billions spent on these areas has not solved Chiapas' problem, right? So we need to look elsewhere to see what is the source uh, of the binding constraint. Yeah, you know, another major infrastructure effort is that now there are beautiful airports all across uh, Chiapas. Uh, the Palenque is home to some of the uh, best Mayan ruins, and yet uh, the flights that go in there, there's only about three flights a week that are able to function in this beautiful airport that they have set up there. So clearly, if infrastructure was the constraint and you built this beautiful airport, why is it then that there are only three flights a week that are, are going in there? and the return on basically this infrastructure investment has been very low. Another argument is that, you know, if the roads are, are stuck, we need a port to be able to export Chiapas' goods to the rest of the world. They spent, again, hundreds of millions of dollars building a port. 
that now lies mostly idle, right? So two major problems were identified. One, the kind of capac capacity minimums were too large for kind of local banana producers to be able to fit that supply. And also the, the kind of international uh, shipping rules means that once you enter one port in one country, you cannot enter into other ports within that country. So if, you, if a Chinese ship was to go to the Chiapas port, it therefore could not actually access some of the, the northern ports that are connected to larger parts of the Mexican economy. So uh, again, this argument that the port was the constraint, we just need to spend more money on the port, now results in a beautiful port that sits uh, very idle, right? So, so one conclusion we take is that rural infrastructure, despite massive spending, was not the binding constraint as we've seen Chiapas's incomes continue uh, to grow at the lowest level uh, in Mexico. So we also applied some of our other thinking. This is a foreign concept to most of you uh, uh, as well. I hope by the end of your time here it is not uh, in interacting with Professor Hausman and others. Uh, so we applied some of our other thinking. Uh, so this is kind of available on the Atlas of Economic Complexity, it's publicly available data to say what does Mexico export, right? So a very diversified set of goods concentrated in electronics uh, and, and vehicles or automotive. When we put it in what we call the product space that shows the kind of connectedness of different products, we see Mexico is heavily concentrated at some of the key parts of the center of the product space. Uh, and is highly diversified. So then we can now do this for the first time on a subnational level. What does Chiapas export, right? So this is a, some of the first uh, visualizations into understanding what does the economy of Chiapas look like. And what we find is a highly non-diversified economy that concentrates in minerals uh, and vegetables and not only uh, you know, very easy prime, basic low complexity primary goods, but also a low diversification uh, that everything that every sector that they're in, they're in very few goods within that sector. So again, we can look, put this back into the product space and say how well connected. Uh, so you know, the theory of economic complexity says kind of where you are in the product space determines how many new opportunities you have. So a country, uh, Chiapas, once you know how to make bananas. It's predictive that those who know how to make bananas can also likely know how to make coffee. Those who make coffee are more likely to be able to move into peppers. So, uh, or oils at the, uh, the top center here uh, traditionally. And basically the capabilities that it takes to produce oil is the capability of digging a hole. And how many other industries rely on the ability of somebody to be very good at digging a hole? Well, that would, by being at the periphery, we would say very few. So by knowing how to be a great coffee maker, coffee kind of producer of cocoa, there is not uh, that many other products that those capabilities link to. So that focus on these kind of periphery uh, items is what limits the diversification potential uh, of an economy like Chiapas. And so, you know, one of the fundamental dynamics that we have found uh, around economics is that countries differ, or locations differ in their diversity. So how many goods you can produce, and also how many other locations know how to produce that good. Right, so, so the raw, uh, the bananas that Chiapas knows how to make, or also everyone else knows how to also be able to produce bananas, versus the x-ray machines or the television screens that Nuevo León knows how to produce. There are very few other places. That's the y-axis, is very few other places know how to make what you do. So we can summarize, uh, you know, a, a, a basic fact of economics is that poor locations know how to produce few things and things that everyone knows how to produce. And rich economies know how to produce a lot of things and things that very few other places uh, know how to produce. So we can do our, analysis, our traditional analysis then on a subnational level within Mexico. We can look at its export complexity and find out that Chiapas is the third worst uh, or least complex state in Mexico. Uh, interestingly, now we can not only look at exports, but also include services in that equation. And when you include services, it, the situation also does not improve uh, in, in Chiapas, but places like Campeche, which are focused uh, on oil, uh, also do not, uh, are not complex regions uh, of Mexico.
But just as we saw, as there isn't one you know, state in Mexico, there isn't one Mexico, there's also not one Chiapas, right? So we see this fractal uh, complex, this is a complexity measure of different municipalities within Chiapas, and we find some of the kind of least complex uh, economies in all of Mexico, but then we still have Tuxla and other parts that are actually highly complex. So kind of how do you deal with an economy that's as stratified or unequal uh, as this? So what we decided to do was to take a few of these key uh, zones and study more deeply what is the diversification potential of some of the larger cities uh, within, uh, within Chiapas itself. Right? So we, we also included uh, our measure of complexity uh, into the equation, which is the economic complexity index there. And we find that actually it has, uh, it explains much more of the difference in the income gap there. So now we can actually see that the explained variable now is more than half. Uh, and actually when you decompose the kind of, uh, uh, when you include the confidence intervals, we actually see that uh, the complexity index, the complexity of the place is better at describing why Chiapas is poor than any other variable, right? So something about the low complexity, the kind of little, con the few connected goods that Chiapas is able to produce, the few, cap the low complexity capabilities that are available locally mean that there are few opportunities to take advantage of uh, in Chiapas. So going back to that product space, you know, we had this big question of saying, okay, you produce a lot of peripheral primary goods, but what is, what is that dot there, right? So we were able to uh, identify and look specifically in saying this is a highly complex uh, you know, product that is being produced in Chiapas, so let's study this further. And that led us to, to the, the plant of Yasaki. So Yasaki is a, uh, a Japanese uh, automotive part producer that is located uh, throughout the north of Mexico. And actually, after the Zapatista Revolution and the intervention of the federal government, began to open plants uh, in the, the south of Mexico. And so the question became, why is it that Yasaki is able to run a very modern, complex uh, production facility in the poorest part of Mexico, uh, in Chiapas, but also where there aren't other related products uh, around? And so what, uh, what we found was a very interesting kind of growth of the plants in Yasaki. They started with their plant in the capital city, uh, again, the most complex part of Chiapas. Then they actually built another plant just outside in some of the suburbs. They built a third uh, plant on the border with Guatemala. Uh, they built another plant 45 minutes away. And so we begin to see that the growth of plants doesn't happen within one plant. You actually began to divide your labor across these different plants. So we had to ask why is it that growth of this industry is not happening in one central location but is being split uh, across different locations. And so the fundamental answer that we found is that there was a lack of, of workers that were able to transport themselves to work uh, on a regular basis there. That in the capital city, the competition was not from other manufacturing firms. It was that the government jobs actually afforded a higher uh, the federal transfers would all concentrate in the capital city, and that would drive up the kind of spending on uh, OXOs or 7-Elevens uh, there. So you had this highly complex uh, service economy and retail that, you know, all of the kind of best 7-Elevens uh, in the world were all located there, and yet there was no kind of tradable or manufacturing base that was able to be grown. And so some interesting reflections on saying the more that you drive up the wages of the retail and other sectors, the more that the wage expectations uh, of the manufacturing base become too high to actually be affordable in those zones. So fundamentally, they began to lose uh, too many workers, and there was no bus system that could move workers from home to get there on a regular basis. So what did they do? Did they ask government to kind of create new bus systems, connect things? No, they actually paid for their own bus system to move workers from the surrounding communities uh, into the capital city. And then they found out that the kind of maximal amount, number of workers they could consistently get was around 1,500. So as the new orders came in, uh, 
They said, let's go out and find other communities where we can set up these plants, where we know that the infrastructure is good enough, the electricity is being provided, there aren't other constraints in the system. They had good success in moving to many of these other rural uh, poor locations as they uh, you know, continue to grow around other parts. So clearly this infrastructural constraints, these other issues that are often commonly cited, were not preventing why Yasaki could grow, but actually some of the infrastructural pieces uh, were, were key. Please. So you're using the term product space versus products you're exporting pretty interchangeably here. Do these plants produce products that then go directly to export or go up to like a factory in Mobile owned somewhere, which then is... Right. Uh, so when I, when I say export, it is the parts of that product that are actually going internationally. And uh, what is being reflected in the product space is the international part of it. So Yasaki specifically has some of its Nissan parts that go directly to the plant in the U.S. And they have some of their Kia uh, cars that go to Nuevo Leon where the car is actually being uh, fully manufactured. So they do both. So that, that's the benefit of the, the product space in the exports sector is still catching the fact that you have a complex firm there. Uh, but yes, uh, the advantage of working subnationally is that we're able to understand kind of domestic transfers and value added within different states that combine, which is kind of the first, well, we're able to identify some of these pieces. If, uh, you know, if you only study international transfers, you're going to miss the key parts of production that go to domestic consumption, the key parts of production that kind of serve other producers in other parts uh, of the same country. So you know it is exciting to just see some of these dimensions for the first for the first time. You know, Professor Hausman calls like uh, he uh, said he had his thinking. He has two sets of thinking. One was pre-Chiapas and one was post-Chiapas. So some of this kind of recrafting of the <coughs> national narrative to move away from kind of uh, federal level uh, or acting like the nation is a unifying entity and actually moving more towards the study of cities as the kind of key locality in which capabilities are really able to be merged and combined. The Scrabble words can be, uh, you'll, you'll hear this later and it'll make more sense, uh, be combined is not on a national level uh, unless you're in a very small country. It actually happens on a much more localized or city level uh, as well. So clearly transportation was an issue. Uh, this was also uh, affected by the fact that you do have, uh, you know, indigenous land cultural practices in which if you leave your land for a certain amount of time, the community can retake uh, your land in the Ejido communities where they work. So that prevented a lot of people from kind of wanting to move to city centers to pursue higher income opportunities because they would lose their land uh, back home. So again, we studied some of those communities as you saw with the kind of low social trust uh, analysis. Uh, we actually were there when they were kind of divvying up uh, communal responsibilities, and they uh, happened to randomly choose that uh, uh, of the eight people uh, on the council uh, that were called through a lottery system, they happened to pick the four people who were working in the United States uh, that therefore had to pay a large penalty to the community for not being able to be there on the council. So, so there is a kind of uh, dynamic of there aren't these large city centers that are being created in part because of land culture, but also how the lack of a city center that is really able to create large workforces is limiting the growth of more complex firms uh, like Chiapas. So some of these lessons kind of double down on each other. So that same community we studied, you know, their 15 minute drive away from San Cristobal de las Casas is one of the greatest, most beautiful kind of colonial cities, not only in Mexico, but in, uh, maybe across Latin America. So beautiful tourist destination, international tourists spending a lot of money there. Uh, these communities 15 miles away and they're not able to fundamentally access that community uh, because there's no transportation system that can get them there. And so we found there's no, there were beautiful roads that could get you there in 15 minutes, but there was no bus system and that the only option was to share a taxi to get back and forth. And so, so you can fundamentally see what you could have earned if you had left Cruston and moved to San Cristobal. So this is what you would have earned. And then we take out, we net out kind of the difference of the actual taxi costs of that piece. So a school principal still will want to go to San Cristobal because they can earn a lot. But fundamentally, a lot of the kind of lower 
specialized uh, industries begin to take out the majority of your salary and transportation costs in accessing uh, the city center. So clearly transportation served as a uh, heavy regressive tax uh, in preventing many kind of occup people's occupations from pursuing employment uh, in the larger city. So they stayed out in the small town of Crustone and, and figured out what they could do, what they could do there. What they ended up producing is that everybody had this thing called push, which is a uh, uh, highly alcoholic, illegal uh, substance, and everybody next door was producing the same thing. So to some extent, you had very low social trust because the only thing you knew how to do was the same thing as the guy next to you knew how to do. And if, uh, if you created anything new, then they would also probably try to figure out how to produce the same thing. And so you had this kind of dynamic in which uh, everybody was competing against everyone else and the only thing that you know how to do was not non-transferable to the person next door, uh, which created some highly conflicting uh, community dynamics. So clearly, uh, some of these dynamics of why city centers haven't you know, created larger labor forces is, is an interesting dynamic going on in, in Chiapas, right? And so even as the Chiapas product space uh, looked very scant, we can even break it down even further to go to this city level and say, what do different cities produce? And again, we see that Tuxla as a city uh, itself actually produces more goods uh, than you know, some of the poorer communities like Comitan. But we're able to analyze that the, productive, the new industries that Tuxla can move into, that they can find related industries, uh, you know, look very different than what we would recommend for other cities, so then we could actually create uh, more tailored recommendations for the diversification opportunities on a local or city level. And uh, uh, again, this is uh, all publicly available data on the Mexican Atlas of Economic Complexity. Uh, but fundamentally, we want to see the distance measures, how related are the capabilities of these new, in these are all the new industries that, that Chiapas doesn't produce. So how related are those industries to what you currently know how to do versus how complex are those industries? So obviously the most kind of the plastics, the chemicals are highly complex and, and actually do not share any capabilities what, with what Chiapas knows how to do. So what we would ideally see is a lot, you know, what we see in Morelos and other parts of Mexico is that uh, the highly complex things are actually very close to what you know how to do. So therefore the opportunity to move in there is less risky versus the distance to your current capabilities in Chiapas is very far so that there aren't a lot of low hanging fruits for Chiapas to move into uh, tomorrow. So everything uh, is a risky venture uh, for much of Chiapas, right? So we can analyze the complexity of different states in Mexico and how easy it is for them to jump into new opportunities. And we see that Chiapas is the least complex uh, in this measure, as well as has a few opportunities for it to jump into. And so we, you know, we did this specific an analysis to say what are the true opportunities for diversification in the different areas. I won't go into de uh, the details uh, of this, but we made kind of specific recommendations for the different city centers that look very different that uh, Tuxla could get into textiles or synthetic fibers versus uh, Tapachula might focus more on food processing and, me and metalware. So kind of a different level of uh, tailoring recommendations now that we were able to move to the subnational level than we were able to see uh, before. Um, you know, I I'll open up the questions now. Uh, there's a few more slides in some of the, the lessons. The one last lesson uh, you know, I'll share is that uh, the, the north of Mexico is under kind of heavy, tight labor cost pres uh, pressure and competition from other parts of the world like China. So one answer to that question, if, if labor costs are, uh, you know, two or three times what labor costs are in parts of Chiapas, then one way to analyze new sectors for Chiapas is to do the Yasaki type of investment and in saying what are the highly constrained or kind of labor cost constrained parts of the north and how feasible would it be to bring one of those plants uh, down to, to Chiapas where labor costs are much lower. Uh, so we've done specific analysis around that. So one key lesson that we've learned is that a very poor part of the country like Chiapas shouldn't be doing what Mexico doesn't know how to do, right? So the International Atlas recommendations of new 
prospects for Mexico really are recommendations for the richest uh, and most complex northern states. But what the southern states should do is not what Mexico doesn't do, but maybe what a middle income city in Mexico knows how to do, or a slightly more complex city in Mexico knows how to do, or migrating some of the know-how of the northern states, bringing some of the experts to run plants down in parts of Chiapas. So we, you know, thinking of it more like an, a ladder of economic complexity in which uh, the next rung of that ladder is probably moving Chiapas more towards a middle income, more diversified state uh, in Mexico uh, was one of the key uh, uh, thinking there. So that has implications like if ProMexico is one of the best investment attraction groups uh, in the world in moving global manufacturers to Mexico, why isn't there a pro Chiapas, right? Why isn't there an investment attraction group that tries to relocate some of the key industries from the north of Mexico, bring them to Chiapas, and, and relocate some of the uh, economic uh, production down to, uh, down to Chiapas? So uh, we have a few other reflections, but I, I want to see if there's any uh, questions in the room. Any thoughts? Please. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the proposed projects for the president-elect is currently suggesting. <coughs> Particularly, I think he's going to transfer the utilities company to Chiapas. He's going to build the, uh, a train, I think, that is going to connect, connect Palenque. And he's also going to build the Isthmus train to do like a brown Panama canal. Uh, Does this like, have any effect? So some, uh, it's a pity Miguel lost his voice because he's kind of continued some of the current conversations. Uh, under uh, President Nieto, we were having uh, the, the big issue of special economic zones. Uh, so they wanted to, of the three new special economic zones that Mexico was going to build, they wanted one to be located in the port of Tapachula that we saw earlier. And one of our basic lessons there is that what constrains the production of, of Chiapas is not building a new economic zone near the port or near the infrastructure. It's building it near the people. So fundamentally, the port of Chiapas lies 35 to 40 minutes uh, away for most people from the town of Tapachula. And so the further you move that gap, as we saw from Cruston, the more regressive. If you don't, there's no housing around the port. Right, as we even saw from the picture there. So the, the more that you create the productive systems to benefit from the infrastructure, the more disconnected you find that the people are from those opportunities. So we didn't think that the putting in a special economic zone next to the port was going to resolve uh, the most binding constraint, which was oftentimes kind of moving people to the economic opportunities uh, was not the solution. You needed to move the economic opportunities to where the people uh, are. So actually around San Cristobal de las Casas is a major population center that could be the kind of a better location for a special economic zone that could still have preferential access to the, the, the port of Chiapas or the road infrastructure that was there. So, so, you know, as we saw from the airports, kind of solutions that focus on infrastructure are a, kind of every politician's dream, but they are not f what has made the situation in Chiapas better despite billions in investment in those solutions. So we would certainly kind of lean strongly away from an infrastructure type solution and look at more of the complementary infrastructure. So the internal transport, the public transportation systems or a more kind of economically led uh, solution that really focuses on economic zones that build around communities rather than assuming that communities will be able to, to get to uh, the economic opportunities that become available. Please. Um, so I was noticing some of the data, or a lot of it, was from 2013 or 2014. Um, have you noticed, are there any notable changes since then in the past four years, or have most of the trends just continued? Uh, I, I will kind of uh, leave some of our Mexican uh, colleagues to answer that question. I, I, uh, the project was done in 2015, so that's kind of the, the latest, or 2015, 2016, so the latest data was 2014. Uh, I hesitate to speculate, but I don't think the situation has improved uh, in a positive uh, direction, much less that the uh, uh, kind of complexity of the place ha has changed directly. Uh, let's see if we can grab Miguel. Miguel! Miguel! Just tell him to come, to come in. Let me, let me make sure you actually believe that he has no voice today. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so this is Miguel. Uh, I, I'm sure you'll see him around. Uh, he teaches in some of the classes uh, as well as uh, being a, another uh, senior research fellow here uh, at CID uh, that we've collaborated on the project together. So another friendly face. Uh, uh, we had some good questions on uh, uh, the, the president-elect's uh, proposals for Chiapas and our thoughts on them that uh, I, I will leave to you to answer once you have a voice again. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so, so I think the, well, we don't see kind of dramatic transformations of kind of production and moving into a new industry it takes a long time to develop. That's one of the most frustrating pieces of, of this is that if you want to go build a new, uh, you know, chemical plant in Chiapas, it's not going to show for another few years. Uh, so we saw some positive kind of developments, but I don't think that we really saw uh, the kind of level of uh, diversification that was necessary to really see a move uh, in the data pieces since. Please. Well, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is after the, even including the economic complexity, after the Oaxaca decomposition, there was a like 36% unexplained. Yep. Do you have any? I think they're having a call in the next uh, adjoining room. <laughs> that oh, Actually, it's coming through on the speakers. That's, that's great. Uh, <laughs> This is, this is the first time we've been in this space, if you, if you haven't been able to tell. Do, do you mind going across and telling them that there's like a button? Two, three. Yeah. <laughs> this is working, right? You can hear me? That, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Loud and clear. Uh, so I, 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 did, I didn't do that uh, decomposition, so I would... Uh, I, no, I mean, uh, so there's a lot of unobserved... So, you know, in this kind of question of is it Chiapas or the Chiapanecos, we know that the kind of, we, there are very few non-identifiable individual characteristics that we think explain that gap, but we think it's something around how the kind of low complexity place is not able to easily pursue uh, new opportunities that then mean that, you know, you have out migration, you have the inability to kind of create uh, large enough population centers for complex produc production to exist. So certainly uh, it is not because, you know, what was learned between the average education level of uh, Chiapas and Mexico in those two years, you suddenly get 50% of your, you know, economic earnings from those two additional years of just learning seventh and eighth grade, uh, you know, math. Uh, so, you know, one of the key lessons that we have is uh, is that everybody learning the same thing as the person next to them in the classroom uh, is not what leads to economic growth. So economic growth is driven by the greater specialization uh, of individuals that then can come together across specializations to produce more complex, uh, complex things. So we don't think it's things like two years more of education of which everybody's learning the same basic education, but we do think it's elements like the lack of kind of specialized individuals who are really able to add uh, a much, you know, more diverse wealth of uh, specialization to make more complex production. So the more that you specialize, the more likely you probably are going to be to out-migrate in a place like Chiapas where there are few opportunities that can take advantage of your specialized uh, know-how. So solving that chicken and egg problem of saying nobody wants to go be a watchmaker in a place where there are, there's not a watchmaking industry, so why would you go study to become a watchmaker if there's no job for you? But no watchmaking industry wants to go to a place where there are no watchmakers. So kind of every new area of know-how that you add on has to resolve this chicken and egg, egg problem of having the industry that can benefit from that know-how uh, or else you're going to have out-migration and, and you're fundamentally will be creating new know-how that won't be effectively incorporated into production. So that dynamic in a place like Chiapas shows that there are very few, the returns to new know-how are lower there than in the more complex areas. If you add new chemical engineers, there are going to be few opportunities in Chiapas. There's going to be plenty of opportunities in a middle-income uh, state in Mexico. So something around that dynamic of why low complex areas are kind of stuck is where the kind of diagnosis went to uh, from some of our colleagues. Please. What other hypotheses do you have for why there was such low kind of social trust in that kind of network analysis you did? I think one you mentioned is that if everyone's making the same thing, then 
you're sort of suspicious of people copying what you're doing. Do you have any other theories as to why that's the contrast is so big? Yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, again, this was done by uh, uh, another team member. So I should humbly say that uh, I didn't actually dig into that uh, specific uh, analysis. Uh, you know, looking back to also what was said about the kind of community members and those who went abroad paying a heavy uh, kind of fine and then everybody trusting that those individuals would then redistribute that money equally to all families creates all kinds of kind of social uh, dynamics. I think, uh, you know, you do see that any new uh, opportunity, I think it's also the, the lack of barriers to entry so it's what we call a one person bite economy, right? So like uh, this is back to the times of like the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. So like one family unit or one individual was able to make all the bread to be a baker, but no one family unit can create uh, an airplane, much less now can create a part to an airplane. So f fundamentally uh, one family unit type operations have very low barriers to entry and that means that if you go, this is why in kind of in, in Cape Town and other places you'll see that kind of one person set up a hair salon and a shipping container and a former shipping container and then two doors down that person is like, oh this person was successful, I'm going to go make the same hair salon two doors down. So the kind of lack of barriers to entry because of the low complexity so anybody can kind of quickly replicate what you're able to do kind of defined why we think one person by economies remain low complexity because of the ability to imitate uh, when in complex cities you're able to do something in which the barriers to entry uh, are significant. So we think of know-how as the key constraint to, to growth. Know-how being kind of tacit knowledge, something that's not held in a book, something, you know, it's why Rafael Nadal is great, uh, but having a conversation with him is not going to make you the great tennis player tomorrow, right? So it can't be passed on very short periods of time. It can't be put into a book. It can't be coded into an iPhone or put in a tennis racket. That means even if you have a tennis racket and read a book about tennis, you're not going to be able to do it. So I think in a lot of those communities, you could create a hair salon and, be, and operate that uh, within a few weeks uh, of operating and get better at it. But in a lot of kind of complex, you know, orchestras and things, require a lot of specialized uh, skills to come together into one location in order to make the music sound as good uh, as it does. So there has to be some kind of grouping of specialized skills uh, behind it and that's not, is, that's not happening in a community like Houston. Please. And to what extent did you look at political factors, especially given Chiapas' recent history and, and how that might interact with the economic uh, characters that you played out. Yeah, we, we met with the governor of Chiapas, who's a very interesting uh, individual because he's of a third party uh, in Mexico uh, and kind of one of the uh, highly touted uh, individuals uh, in politics. But, you know, uh, what was very interesting about this project is that it was funded by the federal uh, government and the Ministry of Finance in order to create better solutions for how kind of federal transfers or federal focus can better improve Chiapas. So then there wasn't the kind of, it wasn't spurred on by the state level. So a lot of our solutions then had to focus on kind of what can federal actions do to improve uh, some of the, the poor states uh, in Mexico. So we weren't kind of heavily, deeply involved in some of the kind of local politics uh, in Chiapas, but there were some important lessons around you know, there was a, the Zapatista revolution meant that there are still actually autonomous uh, uh, communities that function separately and the way that the government tried to kind of turn communities back in was back towards being part of the federal government was by offering a lot of social transfers. And so this is not the, uh, not simply the conditional cash transfer programs like Oportunidades, Prospera, whatever the new name is that they'll come up for that program. These are additional social transfers that are being offered. So the solution was often this kind of rote infrastructure solutions. The solution was kind of these non-inventive social transfers. And that often kind of allowed people to sustain rural livelihoods in one person, one person by communities or low complexity communities. And actually to some extent prevented a lot of the kind of traditional urbanization in pursuit of higher incomes uh, that we've seen elsewhere. So uh, there is a kind of heavy lack of 
focus on economic uh, policy uh, happening, and uh, that's why we, you know, we, some of the think why there's not a pro Chiapas, why there isn't a kind of economic agent that's trying to attract uh, new know-how down to the south uh, of Mexico, uh, is kind of a, a radical concept for the current uh, state of affairs. So what, what can local governments do, and, and how do you marry that with the low capacity of the states and municipalities to uh, of their, of their tax income? Right. Um, perfect question. Again, not the specific question we looked at, but I'll, I'll take the, the case of uh, uh, Yasaki, right? So Yasaki opened four plants, one in uh, Oaxaca, one in Campeche, and neither of those two survived. So one question was, you know, growth diagnostics will be kind of not why did you survive, but also kind of why did, was it differential to the success of two other plants that opened at the same time? Uh, the story of Oaxaca was basically just never got off the ground. There just wasn't the right investment of like know-how know that unexperienced. So what happened in, in Chiapas is that they had the experienced manager that was the number two person at a plant in the north, then got the opportunity to move to Chiapas to run his own plant that he found to be a great opportunity, ran the plant well, got 10 trained uh, uh, engineers to come down with him. So you had this kind of movement of know-how in which the experience came with the plant to ensure that it kind of sustained itself locally. And then they found that to be a great model that after six years of operation, they had experienced individuals that then could get the opportunity to run some of the other plants uh, around it. So this kind of key focus on know-how happened that was different to other states in Mexico. Uh, so kind of focusing on investment, not just as a kind of flow of money, but really on the kind of how are you going to, the flow of trained and experienced uh, individuals is one of the key dynamics that not many kind of investment agencies are, are focused on, much less local governments. And another dynamic was, you know, Campeche offered free land and a lot of other incentives. The oil money was flowing in and they said, you know, we'll, we'll take any new industry, you come, you get free land, you get all of these other social transfers. And they found out that a lot of firms came in at the same time, such that the workers, they had a kind of uh, race to the top for worker salaries that they would leave to go get a better offer next door, such that they just could not sustain a workforce uh, there because workers would run off to the next opportunity tomorrow. So there are you know, other areas in which local governments have been too heavily involved in other states in Mexico uh, to say that you know, Chiapas is not there. Right now there isn't a kind of focus on uh, uh, diversification or trying to attract new manufacturers locally, uh, but that uh, there are some kind of worrisome signs that you can also go too far uh, on, that, on that work as well. So thinking about where to locate economic zones is a major uh, effort, kind of really trying to identify what is the binding constraint, like pointing out things like complementary infrastructure and public transportation, when the solutions that are even are currently being proposed much more focus on trains and other solutions that we would think uh, are not what is constraining uh, individuals currently. Uh, and, um, you know, I think more integrally thinking of communities and social life as not just being kind of you build a plant, you build housing, but why is it that individuals are not willing to leave their communities is something that's not being kind of keenly studied, uh, but we think is a key constraint to, uh, to growth. So rethinking housing policy is certainly one, uh, one key element as well. Please. Do you have some thoughts on... Uh, whether this indigenous component uh, plays a role here. I mean, uh, to give an example, I live in, in a community, in an indigenous community, I had a chance in, to, to live one year in, in the north part of Mexico. And before they think of prosperity or economic growth, I mean, they were thinking of social justice, dignity, autonomy. So whether this this kind of like an explanatory uh, component that you have there uh, comes from the fact that we, we are uh, unable to to look or to dig deeper into the indigenous mindsets and like the way they think like, of life or I don't know like whether you think that that plays a role or not in Chiapas particularly that is heavily. I mean yeah exactly so you saw it in the Oaxaca blender decomposition we put you know whether you identify as indigenous into that calculation and, and find that actually the uh, you know indigenous communities don't actually earn that much less than some of the other communities in Chiapas so we went to uh, a town uh, up in the hills that was non-indigenous, uh, 
and had a higher education level than uh, uh, another town that was just outside of San Cristobal de las Casas that was indigenous and poorly educated and found that uh, Zina Cantan, which was the indigenous community, actually had a higher income level than the non-indigenous, more educated community that was up in the hills uh, in the mountain area. And what we basically found is that Zina Cantan can produce flowers that can be sold to high-end hotels in uh, San Cristobal de las Casas and kind of be a part of that economy on a regular daily basis in ways that uh, Pejucal de Ocampo, which is the non-indigenous community, was three hours away from uh, the nearest city and therefore kind of limited in its ability to really benefit from a more complex uh, city center. So the income levels that they could afford or the products that they could make required longer time to, you know, to the market. And therefore that was a key constraint to kind of the economic returns or the, uh, the products that they could get into, get into there. So, uh, you know, while the decomposition shows that indigenous factors kind of contribute to explain some part of that. In, you know, in our actual research, we found that, you know, Yasaki is basically being run uh, by an entirely indigenous uh, workforce. And they found no differences between hiring an indigenous uh, individual and a non-indigenous uh, worker. Beca and they were able to run the plant equally well with two weeks of training uh, with either type of workforce. So, so certainly local communities have specific dynamics. Uh, some of these migratory and kind of housing uh, decisions are playing an impact on, on some of these dynamics, uh, as you could tell from the decomposition, but we don't think it's the key constraint uh, to, you know, we, have, we see many indigenous individuals participating in some of the most complex parts of the production uh, in the state of Chiapas. So it's, it's a piece of it, but it's, we don't think it's the kind of uh, definitive uh, definitive piece of uh, piece of the puzzle. Uh, so, if you have any more questions, I invite you to talk to to team. I just want to be mindful by four of uh, everyone's time. So, thank you very much for coming. I.